as I was moving up, I was able to see my body and I saw where people were in the room. I saw stains on shoes. I saw untied, one untied tennis shoe shoelace of one of the OR runners. I mean, it was amazing. And I saw my husband off to the side and he had tears in his eyes. And, and When I talk about what happened, I understand and I assume the listener understands that a near-death experience, or at least what I experienced, is not is it's not a human thing. It's something that happens, at least I believe it happens on another dimension of the consciousness. And I say that very honestly because I was a nurse before I was a before I became a practicing psychologist. And so credibility and science and the medical um, discipline means a lot to me. And because of that, in a way, when I tell this story, I realize that some of that credibility, I really do put on the line because a lot of times when I think about the colors I saw or the way my my body or what I felt was my body registered things was very different than my, you know, being locked into this body in a human form every day. So, um, and as I get into the story, I'll try to just make note of that so people understand that I am aware of that. I under I understand parts of it just sound like sci-fi, but at the same time, I, I although I understand that, I'm not going to change what happened. And so part of my whole journey was really making sure that I kept a journal, that I would check out the facts that after the whole, after I was you know, getting healthy and I began working on the book, I actually went to attain my medical records and talk to the neurosurgeon because it was very important to me that I wasn't on hallucinogens or I wasn't on a medication that would have made my mind fabricate or believe something that wasn't wasn't true or factual from the experience. And um, and I didn't find those things to be true. So I just I just fully commit to what happened. And um, and I at the same time, I'm very aware of the um, creator of God's hand in the whole thing. So the way this happened was I was working out at the gym the um, Saturday before Easter in 2003. It's I was raised in a Roman Catholic home, and that's referred to as Holy Saturday. My husband was already working at a job in Houston, Texas. I We were living in Lubbock, Texas, and I hated it there. And the whole time we moved there from Houston for my husband's work. So when he was able to secure the position he wanted nine years later in Houston, um, I was really excited about moving there. And we were going to move back to Houston in May of 03. And so this happened in April, like a month before we were to move back. And the symbolism of that is during the last six months that we were in Lubbock, my husband had taken the job at MD Anderson in Houston um, at a time that that the slot was open and that was in November of 02. So for six months, we were going to live apart and commute, which you would say, well, wasn't that big of a deal, but we'd been married for a long time. So it really was a big deal. This Saturday, he happened to be in town because we were celebrating Easter with friends and everything. So I was at Gold's Gym the morning of my aneurysm and um, I was working out. I did a spin class and because I'm an avid exerciser, I decided, well, after that, I'm going to lift weights. And I was lifting pretty heavy weights. Like I was really trying to build my strength and my stamina. 
And when I was working out on the on the chess machine, I pressed it one time and I was like, oh my God, this is a lot heavier. I had this idea that if my legs could bench press twice my weight, that my upper body should at least be able to lift my weight. And I weigh, I weigh what I always weighed. I weighed 107 pounds. So I had I had my mindset that I would try to push it to 98 pounds that morning. And um and after I pushed it once, I thought, oh man, you got to do at least two. And the first one, I could tell it was really strenuous. The second time I pushed it, I felt the pop in the back of my neck. And I thought from my clinical training, you know, like I'm a nurse at heart. So I'm thinking, what happened? Because it felt like somebody stabbed the back of my head. And then all of a sudden, I couldn't hear my eyes. You know, I could only see out of little peripheral holes on the side of my head, like my vision was really limited, like a really narrow tunnel. And I could only see here. Um, and and so I got off the machine still thinking I had broke my neck. And I thought, well, maybe it's a vasovago response, which you'll sometimes get when there's a big flux in blood pressure. So I went over to the water fountain and I went to, to take a drink of water. But when I did this, the right side of my body, like my hand started going up and down and my leg did too. And it was involuntary. Like I had no control over it. And then I got really scared. I thought, oh my God, something is really wrong with me. So I, I kind of stumbled like away from the fountain and I laid down because I thought I was going to fall. And this big guy came back and I had seen him at the gym before and he used to call me muscle woman. And he said, hey, muscle woman, you know, what's the matter? And I said, you better call somebody in the front. I think I, I think I broke my neck. And so somebody came back from the front and she was so loving and comforting. And she just, you know, talked to me and she told me they would call an ambulance. And I was still very with it. I told her I thought I broke my neck, but I could really smell blood. And um, she said, well, you're not. So anyway, the ambulance came and they took my blood pressure and everything. And it was, of course, very high. And they told me, we think you had a bleed in your in your head, in your brain. Um, we're going to take you to the hospital. And meanwhile, they were calling my husband. Of course, back then, we didn't have cell phones. In 2003, at least we didn't personally. And so they located him by calling my daughter, who is home from college, the oldest one. And she was at our house. They called our house, got her, and she knew where my husband was. So when I went to the ER, he was there. And he had been on staff there. And I had worked there as the head of a psycho-oncology unit. So they all knew who I was when I came in. Like, they knew of me. They knew my husband better. And um, they did a CAT scan. And the neurologist said, um, you know, he told my husband her head is just full of blood. The guy that was there was filling in. He was a uh, retired neurologist, and he said, you know, I, I don't know what happened, but, you know, she's just got so much blood, they're going to have to stabilize her. And then within a couple hours, he had, um, he had talked to the other neurologists at the other hospital because they, they knew they had to do an angiogram to identify where the blood was coming from because it was still bleeding. Whatever it was, you could see it pulsing into the brain. And so, um, but the problem was there was a neurology convention in Santa Fe that weekend. And Lubbock is like a hub city for all these, you know, desolate areas around it. Santa Fe is probably like a six hour car trip from there, probably, two hours to fly it. But all the neurologists were at a conference except a pediatric neurologist. 
So he tried to do an angiogram and he just said there was so much blood that he, there was, you couldn't even identify where, like where the vessels were. So since I was doing well at that time in the ICU, they decided they would stabilize me. And on Easter Sunday, so this went through the night and my husband was just, just so scared um, as any physician would be. So Easter Sunday, um, I felt pretty good, except I was very nauseous. And when you have a a brain bleed, like you are immobilized, like you cannot move. So I was in the ICU and I remember a couple of my friends coming up and my husband was there off and on. We still had a child that was 13. So he was going back and forth to the house because the kids really couldn't come up yet um, in the ICU. And I was in just such a guarded situation. He wasn't comfortable with that, nor was I. So they decided they would put a drain in. And so they put a drain in my head and um, started draining out some of the fluid. And and I was pretty just kind of in and out, but mostly, you know, st- what they would consider stable. They were doing a lot of tests, hourly, um, you know, s- um, sonograms just to see what the vessels, because you get a lot of vasoconstriction uh, and that's what causes brain damage. So they were very, very clear about monitoring that. And then Monday followed and Monday they said, well, she's doing better. Like her vitals are all good. I didn't feel that good, but, but I did feel like, um, like I was having more moments where I could think and I was pretty clear with what was going on. So Monday night, Monday during the day, they moved me out of the ICU and moved me into a normal room. And they decided they would wait until Tuesday when the, or no, Wednesday until the surgeons came back from this meeting um, before, you know, before looking at a surgical approach or something like that. Monday night, I, the nurse came in to take vitals and my member, the nurse, the nurses around 11 PM told my hubby, you should go home. You should go home and sleep. We're watching her. We're going to be coming in and doing checks. So he went home. And so this would have been about one or 2 AM. And, um, and the nurse woke me up and she had a, a, Uh, one of those pulse odometers on my finger. And all of a sudden, like there was a lot of action, like they were moving me. And she said, you are really sick and we're going to move you back um, into the ICU. And, um, and we're going to, you know, we're going to start looking at some other options. I didn't know what that meant, but, um, and I was kind of groggy so I, all I remember, like I was in and out, but I remember waking up for a short time and it seemed like, it seemed like it had just happened, but actually 12 hours had passed since then. And, um, and my husband was sitting with me and he was, he was saying like, um, he wasn't, wasn't talking that much, but he was saying to me, Mary, I, I'm nervous about you because you're not nervous. And the whole time, like in the ambulance, I remember that the pain was so bad that I don't know if you've ever had that kind of maddening pain. Like if you let go or you cry, you will lose total control. Like I just, it, it was so severe that at that point, I remember telling God, I, your will be done. You, I have had a wonderful life and, and I, you have done so much for me and I cannot handle this. So if it is my time, your will be done. And I used to hear patients 
tell me that they submitted their cancer to God or submitted their life. And <clears throat> I always thought that was so brave. Like, who would do that? And then as I was saying those words, I remembered that. But what came from that was an incredible calm. And that incredible calm lasted through this whole journey or blessing or whatever you call it now. And when my husband said that to me, I told him, what I, that was Tuesday later in the day, Ron, I gave this to God and I don't know if I'm going to live. I, it's in his hands. I, I can't, there is nothing I can do. So as the, as a day went on, they, um, the surgeons came back and I guess one of them came back early, an aneurysm specialist that had been trained in Dallas, which is where they considered sending me for care. Um, and he told my husband, we need to do surgery. Like this, this is a classic aneurysm and she's got a blood burst and it's still bleeding. So what was interesting is he told Ron that. He did not tell me that at the time. Like I was sort of in and out anyway. But during that time when he was talking to Ron, I was I was laying down in bed and I was in that state of consciousness where I was very aware, but I really wasn't talking. I had no energy to talk or anything else. But I do remember seeing this light and it was on the right hand corner of like where I was looking up. And it wasn't, you know, people talk about that light or tunnel. And I think what's interesting for about it is when I saw it, I've worked in ICUs, I've worked in operating rooms, I've worked in every area of the hospital. It's not a light. It just looks like a light. It's an opening or what would you call it? A portal. It's like, it's not even a tunnel. I looked at the light and I said, wow, is that, is that the tunnel? Like, it's so weird. It's so small. I was not impressed. I mean, it was like this big around. And I kept thinking, how, wh what is that? I was just so curious. And all of a sudden, I was moving into that light. And I remember that I could see behind my head, which I know makes no sense at all, except someone who works with NDA, NDEs, a scientist, told me that when you're out of the body, you're not constricted by the bone structure of the body. So to have vision all around you would mean you were in another level of consciousness, like you weren't in this anymore. And that really resonated with me later after, after this whole experience, because as I was moving up, I was able to see my body. And I saw where people were in the room. I saw stains on shoes. I saw untied, one untied tennis shoe shoelace of one of the OR runners. I mean, it was amazing. And I saw my husband off to the side and he had tears in his eyes. And I just kept moving. And I was, I was not afraid. I was warm. I was so comfortable. I don't remember being excited or sad. I just remember feeling loved. And as I moved up there um, or in there, there um, I had the sensation that God held me. And he, um, he said, it's not your time. He called me by my name. He said, you know, Mary Jo, it's not your time. And I protested. I said, what do you mean? You know, I, and I started right away launching into my accolades. Like I'm a good mom. I'm a, I was a great nurse. I'm a great psychotherapist. I gave free care to cancer. Like I'm trying to impress God. I know it sounds 
just sounds so crazy, but but it is what happened. And then he said, let me ask you one question. Have you ever loved the way you've been loved here? And I said, no, it's impossible. I'm a human. And and it's he said, you can do better. And then he it felt like he held me tighter. And then I was back in my bed. And Ron was shaking my arm and crying and saying, Mary, Mary. And then I looked at him and he said, Mary, this is really scary stuff. Like they've got to do this surgery and I've got to sign this. And they told me you you might not come back um, the way you are. You might not, you know, you might not be able to think the same or to talk. You might not ever be able to run again or even walk. And he's just like, and I said, don't worry about it. Just sign it. And I said, I just talked to God and it's not my time. And he thought I was hallucinating because that brought him no comfort at all. In fact, I think just looking at his body motions, it made him more afraid. And he said, I, I'm going to sign this, Mary, and, and we'll figure it out, whatever, whatever happens. And then, um, and then what I remember after that is I woke up and Ron was there and it must have been the next morning. And he, um, Ron goes, oh, my God, you're you're awake and and you look good. And I went, yeah, just my luck. I, I got to live or something like that. Like just my luck. I have to be here and stay alive. Or I just remember I did use a swear word, a cuss word. And, and that made him really laugh because he went, Oh my gosh, you are back. And, um, and then the neurosurgeon came like very shortly after. I think the nurses notified him that I was awake. And he asked me who the president was, which hospital it was. And I joked with him because there's a big rivalry between the university hospital and Covenant. And I had the surgery at Covenant. So I said, I think I'm at the university hospital. And he he's like, no, you're not. You're, you're at Covenant. And I laughed and, and he went, oh my God, like, I, I can't believe that. So, and from there, my healing just was remarkable. I, I left two days early against sort of what they wanted, but, um, but I know that I know what I had. I know I was with God and and I do like a lot of people talk about unconditional love or agape love. I honestly don't think humans understand what that is because I have never been loved the way I was there. And it's like, it's like comparing it to plastic or um, something so fake that you wouldn't, you wouldn't recognize it. And I'm from a big Italian family, and I thought I knew what love was. Um, the other thing that's so interesting about this story is a lot of people say, well, it was your faith that got you here. I don't think so. I was the most separated from God at the time this happened that I have ever been in my life. I had been working uh, as I told you, as the head of a psycho-oncology unit, and part of that was going to the pediatric oncology. And that just broke my heart. Like, I started getting really jaded to see those kids in the hospital and dying and counseling the, the parents when their child was going to die. And I used to, like, really struggle with what kind of a God would put people through this, especially a loving God. And I'm not saying I understand suffering, but I do see that 
that when you love like God does and he's the omnipotent creator, you can't second guess him. It's just, it's not, we're, we're so limited. Like there, there is another life and we're going to go back to it. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure this human form is, is a shell. Mary Jo, thank you so much for sharing your experience. Would you mind me asking you a couple questions? Sure. I would love to hear if and how this experience has changed you personally. I know, I believe you said that you were raised Catholic and you did have a relationship with God throughout your life. Has that changed at all since your experience? Um, I think I am more um, diligent about talking with God, about keeping that relationship strong. A a lot of people tell me how lucky I was. And um, no, I have to disagree with them. Lucky would have been leaving that day. And I say that coming from someone who loves life, who loves their, their husband. I love my kids. I now have grandkids. And there's not one part of human of my human life I have not been so happy and excited about. I've had to suffer, but overall, the suffering has made me more grateful for everything. But I will say that we We feel so bad when someone dies, but it is, I think the dying process is scary, but I think it's so incredible what happens to us. And make no mistake, I'm a psychologist. I, When I came back from here, I went through depression. And the more I've read about people who have had these experiences, they are depressed after they come back here. There is that separation, like, oh my God, I want I want to go back there. And, you know, I don't know if that's the final place. I don't know if I will see that again, or if that was something that happened in the long process of eternity. But I can tell you, it's not something people should fear. It is something that is is as unimaginable as you could look out at a vast universe and even try to ponder. So I think I think it's made my relationship much more one of awe, once one one of more humility and just I thank God for everything. Mm. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that encouraging message. Um, uh, During the part where God was holding you or you sensed that God Mm -hmm. was holding you, was that more of a deeper experience or did you actually see and feel things with your five senses? I I felt his arms around me. I did not see him. And, you know, it's strange. I have no visual image of what he looked for, like, except his voice. I know his voice. I knew his voice. And this is where it just gets so, so crazy, Melissa. When I tell people that his voice came through my skin and my other senses, I'm pretty sure when God calls any of us, we will know it. Because it's a source we came from. I I truly believe that. I was just going home. People talk about going home all the time. We and and I know we say, well, they went home to the Lord, but I really felt like I was going home. This is where I came from. And I'm pretty sure everyone will be there. Like, I think all of us are souls and we're going to go back to that. It's made me look at babies different. And I used to be very pro-choice, pro-choice, pro-choice. And even though now I don't 
I don't necessarily want a law saying you cannot end a life or end have an abortion or you know anything like that i i do still think it's up to that individual and god i do think that soul was planned and and i don't know where that came from it just really changed when i after and i don't you know i was always um I was raised Roman Catholic, but we weren't like my dad. We we live far away from the church, so we weren't the church wasn't something. I didn't go to Catholic school or anything else. So my parents were pre- pretty broad minded about things like children and babies, and they love babies. But I don't think they would have been comfortable, you know just being totally pro-life. I don't know. Maybe they would have. Anyway, I don't think that was passed on to me. I think it was this experience that just really reiterated something for me. Wow. Now, this is sort of a different topic, but some near-death experiencers see or remember that they existed before this life and then they planned to come into this life. What do you think Mm -hmm. about that? Well, you know, that's really interesting. And I, you know, I, I can't, I can't make a hypothesis. I do think the decision was, was made by the creator, God. Um, I don't know if we had a part in that. Part of that resonates with me. I could understand that depending on what the soul's purpose was. Um, but I do believe every soul that comes here has a purpose. And I think that's what makes me see life now as much more mm, sacred. I don't know another word to say for that. Like you, you, you must live it mm. or, or it, it must be. It must have a story here if it was brought here. Mm. I love the way you phrased that. Well, you know, it's it's very difficult because, um, you know, I have a lot more, um, I feel a lot more guilt with little things like sins I make now than I ever did before. When before the aneurysm, when I sinned, and I do think sin is a separation from God, so I better define that. And I do think we sin consciously. Like I think we know, even if someone wasn't raised, taught certain things, I do think God's implanted that within our soul. I think we know. So when I used to sin in the past, I I would tell myself, well, you know what? I'm not sure I got to experience this or I would make an excuse. Now I can't. And I had a very clear idea that any limits human beings have here on earth that aren't physical are self-induced. So when my clients make excuses, I'm like, you know what? It's okay if you need that excuse. It's okay if you need that limit, as long as you recognize it, that it belongs to you. The limit belongs to you. It's not God's, not your lot in life. It belongs to you. And I hold myself to that same standard. And it's hard. It's really hard. And I feel guilty when I fall short because I know, I know what a slap in his face that must be. I mean, I I think he's a creator of good. I'm not sure people have asked me, well, then how do you account for evil? I don't know. Who knows the mind of God? I, I don't. That sort of leads me into another question I wanted to ask you. So during your experience, 
God asks you if you had ever loved the way that you were loved there. And your response was to tell him that, no, it's impossible. I'm human. Yes. So how how do we do that? Because before your experience, it, it sounds like you were a good person, a good loving person, giving free care to cancer patients and being a good wife and mother. Um, how do we love unconditionally like God loves us? Well, I think, I think it's impossible. Honestly, I think the most we can do is to continue to try. And, you know, I told God all these accolades, but really when I think back, like God must have just, I must have amused him because was I really a good mom? I mean, I was still selfish about what I wanted. Was I really giving free care? Not, not altruistically. I mean, there was something in it for me. I mean, I look at people who tell me they're godly people or really good people. When you have to say that, you're probably not. And so I, that was a true, um, a true lesson in humility after, because it's in my book and it was said by me. And so I know I said that. And I think now, wow, that's pretty vain, pretty arrogant that you would tell God this. I, I honestly don't know anyone, any human that I can say really has true agape love. Even a child has their needs. Maybe a dog, but even a dog wants something from the master. And I I think we struggle. I mean, Jesus said himself, you want to follow me? Give up everything you love. Give up your phone. Give up your computer. Give up all these other idols that you spend more time with than you spend with me. And then come back. And how many came back? Only the desperate, only the ones that were going to starve or die. And probably if Christ were here today, we would have a very similar reenactment. Would probably be the street people, but even they couldn't take the rigorous lifestyle of Christ. Mm -hmm. Like you have to walk every day, you have to starve. You don't get to eat except at night. Mm -hmm. It's, it's just very amazing that, you know, I remember that um, after the aneurysm. So I'd been in a cancer center and one of the doctors there well, I was very close to and um, he was the head of the con- oncology unit. And I was going to go up just a couple before I left Lubbock to say goodbye to everyone I worked with. And um, and he was driving. And a a white hearse went by and he said, man, you are so lucky, Mary Jo. That could have been you in that hearse. And I said, you know what? I think I think that would have been a much easier and almost um, or how do I say that? I think that would have been an easier trip. I have to travel now. And I said, I also, you know, no matter what, I said, I've thought about what could have happened. You know, 90% of all aneurysms have a deficit. They can't walk or they can't think or they have a problem. I said, whatever I would have gotten, I would have, I would have, I would have celebrated it because it was from him. He, he communicated to me. And he told me, it's not my time. So I knew whatever I ended up with, I was going to have to live with. But it came from God. I no longer had to second guess. I no longer had to be fearful. And I feel that way now. I don't have to fear death anymore. It's going to hurt. Dying is really painful. 
And it is really scary. But once you're in that place with God, I I think it's going to be unbelievable. That's beautiful. Mary Jo, would you like to share with us one message that you feel sums up your experience that you would like to pass on to everybody? Um, you know, I I just... I'm just very protective of this blessing. And I want to be sure that when people listen to my story, they understand I'm not a prophet. I I don't know what happens to loved ones when they die, but I do know what my experience was and what makes this so poignant for me in my career as a therapist is I work, couples can come in to see me and say, you know, Um, We'll do anything to save our marriage. We have two little kids. We'll do anything. And I'm like, okay, so if you'll do anything, then let's go through and identify the things you need to do. Come home right after work. Um, You have to commit to going out on a date night once a week. You have to spend at least 30 minutes a day without your phone talking to each other. And I give them little tasks. And you know what? They can never change. And it takes years to get one partner to pick up their underwear or socks. I was with God, they estimate probably one to two minutes, and my whole life changed. Nothing was the same. Not one thing. My whole thought process was completely changed. If God can do that in one minute, then um, then just imagine what it's going to be like. He's our creator. He's always creating. And no matter what anybody's going through, he's creating something that's going to help this with the solution. But I think... I think we forget that because life is busy and we get distracted. And if you have an aneurysm, you can't get distracted because you are just with him. Would you like to share a little bit about what you do and your website, your YouTube channel, anything else that you've done that you would like to share? Oh, thanks. I, my website is my name, MaryJoRapini.com, and that's Joe without an E. And um, and my YouTube is my name, Mary Jo Rapini. I work with couples and with individuals, and I work on the premise that um, the greatest relationship you'll ever have, the one that depicts all other relationships is the one you have with yourself. So no matter what you're going through in your marriage or what you're going through at work or personally, you have to get back at who you are and what's going on with you. And there's three aspects that are very important. What your thoughts are, what your spiritual life is, and what you want to leave on this earth before you leave. Those three things have to be assessed before you really should date or get in another relationship or anything else. Because those three have got to be solid. Like you have to be aware of what you're putting in and what you're taking out. Thank you so much, Mary Jo. I will have all of Mary Jo's links in the description if you're interested in checking those out. Thank you so much for having this conversation with me. I've really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you so much, Melissa. It's a great way to start a new year. 